at a broad level, we're starting out here um, in a in a journey that is going to take us on this one transect through to um, uh, to uh, a certain point where we're working, hopefully with a growing level of comfort with the notion of a category and the notion of functors between categories. You haven't seen functors yet. Um, you will probably uh, by next session, and if not that, by the next one beyond that. Um, that will get us to a certain breadth of repertoire, um, and uh, it will tie it in with some foundational concepts from, uh, from programming, and particularly from functional programming and, and functional software engineering. Having done so, um, and and had a set of categories, um, and a certain familiarity with with sort of basic components um, uh, as they relate to programming um, that illustrate categorical concepts, ideas like lifting a function um, through through uh, through, through uh, applying a functor to that function to lift it to another category. Um, from one category to another. Uh, having developed a certain facility and comfort with that, we'll loop back around and and then go through some foundational material that will get us onto a track to appreciate additional categories based more on mathematical concepts uh, such as uh, partially ordered sets or pre-orders, so posets and, and pre-orders, uh, such as um, a monoids, uh, these structures that uh, allow us to combine um, uh, successive uh, successive elements uh, with uh, a monoidal operation, sometimes called tensor product, to keep it fairly general. But examples might be plus, times, max, etc. Uh, and we'll um, uh, we'll see how those structures uh, lend a certain understanding of, of mathematical structure um, on the one hand ordered structures, pre-orders uh, posets, on the other monoidal structures um, and then we'll see monoidal pre-orders um, that combine both and that will bring us to categories and actually V categories um, uh, these enriched categories before we actually come to the, to the seminal definition of category and we'll explore functors in that concept. And so we'll have reached, as it were, this destination with two different transects, two different pathways. One, as it were, a pathway through the lowlands following the river valleys and, um, and uh, streams that will uh, take us to this destination of categories and functors. And then we'll take the, the overland route um, uh, that, that requires a bit more traction and a bit more um, energy, uh, but will give us a broader repertoire category-wise. Categories for pre-orders, monoidal categories, monoidal functors, and we'll be ending up in the same place, um, the, same, the same destination uh, uh, from both sides. And hopefully that will uh, give you a, a broader understanding of, of what we're dealing with here. The overland route will will be an upland route where we'll see some of what we traversed before down there in the river valleys, much as if you were driving up from Regina to Saskatoon and you saw the Arm River Valley to your right, um, or you pass through the, uh, uh, through the uh, Capel Valley on the way. Uh, we'll encounter some of the places we've already traversed uh, in, the, in the rivers. And, and this is gonna take a total of maybe six lectures, and, and this is the first of them. We're, we're on our way in the River Valley route, um, which is a bit easier going for for programmers. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's the plan. But I'd like to begin, um, as I want, with uh, some slides to uh, to situate us and to um, to remind you of some of what we've seen, but also to um, uh, give you some waypoints with which you want to pay uh, a particular attention. So um, I'm going to share my screen and I see that um, it tells me the host has to enable participant uh, sharing. Okay, this is, um, I think this is another effect of um, 
having uh, Christine set up these meetings. So I'm going to uh, uh, log in as host on my smartphone and I'm going to lend myself uh, uh, the host privileges and then leave in short order here. So uh, pardon me for just a second while I uh, grant myself uh, the privileges attendant upon hosthood. Um, okay, so uh, there we go. And I am going to confer to myself host hostness. Okay, um, I think I am in this incarnation now the host. So let's, let's give that a, a try. Ah, I see the signs. Okay, great. Um, okay, okay. Uh, Let's let's see. I could ask, do you see it? But I see it on my phone, so I'm lent confidence that you probably see it. Now the trick is I have to leave the meeting without closing it. Okay, I've done that from my phone. Um, the world is sane again, and we can begin. Um, could someone make a uh, an utterance to the effect that you can to confirm whether you can hear my voice? Because it will be a dull hour if I d deliver this lecture and you can't hear me. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, it'll be a dull, but perhaps uh, a more pleasant um, hour <laughs> if, if you couldn't hear me. Okay, so foundational materials. I have something on the order of, of five or six slides here. Um, nothing grand, but it should remind us of some of the very variegated content you've seen. So I asked you to review a set of quite disparate videos. Um, these videos ran the gamut from a six to seven minute introduction on sort of what is category theory that used the, the metaphor of a desert island and, and uh, being stuck on it and, and tried to fit in a set, uh, a set of category theoretic concepts of importance within that uh, within that context and, and tried to illustrate them at some level by um, uh, by concrete references as, as best the time could afford. A um, uh, bit thin, but it gives a sense for some people of kind of the broad totality of where we're at. Um, uh, so, so concepts came up there of things like objects and morphisms and functors and natural transformations. Uh, I can't remember with clarity, but uh, perhaps that junctions came up as well, um, uh, and uh, a variety of uh, additional elements that are that are somewhat more specialized. Um, so, uh, gave you a sense of many of the same many uh, many of the um, leading actors, the roles they play vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, uh, I'm going to go a bit lighter on that in my discussion. It it relates to some of the enumerative characterization of, of core concepts we, we've talked about before. Um, uh, one that was maybe more um, concrete and eye-opening, or at least it gave a sort of vastness of vision, but it, it tied it in with certain... Uh, reference points for those more familiar with math was uh, David Spivak's um, uh, lecture on called Invitation to Applied Category Theory that was part of the ACT 2020 conference this past uh, summer. And, you know, David, um, within, this, uh, within this talk, uh, used it to introduce certain... Um, specific uh, structures that illustrated category theoretic concepts. Uh, he borrowed some of them from others. From e Eugenia Chung, he borrowed uh, the, um, for example, the factorization of numbers. Um, uh, and he made use of uh, some references to, uh, to uh, various meets and joins over pre-orders, such as uh, with, with Max, uh, Min, etc. And he saw that you know there were certain features of the situation um, that came out again and again. So limits and co-limits, networks of relationships, different meanings of what an arrow means. Um, you know whether one thing is less than another versus whether one thing divides another. Um, 
but certain things held across them. So we had these kind of meets and joins, for example, which get manifested in, in different ways depending what an arrow means. Um, uh, and, and yet they're, they're really useful concepts um, across these different spheres. So you might have, you know, uh, set union on the one hand, uh, whereas you have a max on the other. Um, uh, and uh, you might have a, uh, you know, least common multiple on yet another. So, so here we have kind of um, rather disparate examples. Um, and he tried to draw on things from different areas of math more broadly. But it's the same recurring themes. Uh, coming up again and again. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, the same actors with different masks on, as it were. Um, and he argued that, look, um, you know, category theory here is this unifying vision for mathematics, not in a, in a sense that's axiomatic, not in the sense that, you know, we're formulating piano axioms and, and uh, uh, we're, we're trying to to offer a, uh, a foundational characterization of, of mathematics based in one area like set theory, um, uh, but rather uh, we, we represent these different spheres of mathematics, whether it's number theory or whether it's differential geometry or whether it's group theory, um, it, it indeed uh, dynamical systems uh, and programming um, programming language semantics we represent that um, in a in a unified framework which can in any one area make use of um, the concept the basic concepts that we saw in that very first video the um, the notion of of categories and, and objects and morphisms within the categories that um, that have to uh, provide certain guarantees like uh, unit um, uh, unit morphisms from an object to itself and, and composition is present um, uh, although it may mean very different things for different categories and then it has to satisfy certain constraints or properties of axioms as it were a unitality and associativity um, the, these things come up in all these different areas and and each area is true to itself and its its considerations, but it's the same basic structures that come up for all of them. Um, now, for us as programmers, this is very encouraging because it means they're not totally, you know, disparate solitudes that each time we need a totally custom solution. There's, there's certain common structures if we can capture them in our libraries, in our programming environments, indeed in our languages, we might we could characterize, um, you know, uh, domains of concern of very different sorts um, with huge generality. Um, and indeed, that's what inspires a lot of my interest in, in category theory. Um, so uh, David, um, you know, emphasized admittedly to a mostly math-oriented audience this integrative vision and the subsumption of these different areas into this overall picture of category theory without doing them the disservice of just uh, saying you have to reinvent, you know, number theory or group theory to, to represent it in this new way. So that's, that's a kind of thought-provoking uh, perspective on things. And he, he noted some features which draw people, um, draw people to it. Now, uh, Eugenia Chung's, I, I actually recommended uh, two talks by... Uh, Eugenia Chung, um, both confusingly share the same name, um, uh, category theory and life. Um, uh, Eugenia has a, um, uh, a very good way of communicating category theoretic concepts in, uh, that weave their way into our daily lives. And uh, the one I've listed here is the earlier of those two. It's one from Lambda World 2017. Um, which um, was kind of uh, a broader, broader look at category theoretic underpinnings or analogs to or um, 
reference points uh, for uh, a variety of, of daily examples, whether it's the idea that, you know, the grandmother of my mother is the, uh, is, is the mother of my grandmother, or whether it was uh, concepts involving uh, folding in ingredients whilst baking, um, or, or the steps of baking a pie. Um, uh, she did a, a, a really good job referring to, you know, how some of these networks of relationships, these successive operations, uh, could be um, could be uh, folded into to, to category theoretic um, uh, thinking. Um, so, uh, application specific objects um, in morphisms, the the objects, what it means for one thing to be connected to another, were just as in David's talk, very different. Um, uh, there, there were composition rules, what it means to compose things that that also are 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 different. Um, so, you know, the composition of a mother and a mother relationship is a grandmother relationship. Um, whereas if we compose A is less than or equal to B with B is less than or equal to C, we get a more, um, um, a, a more uh, familiar example of A is less than or equal to C. Um, uh, and, and she also had the, the, the uh, factors of, of numbers uh, up to 30. Um, which she's actually been the one who's championed it, and David Spivak and others have, have uh, drawn on that. Um, uh, she also spoke about, uh, well, she spoke about the orderings, um, and, and she talked about how abstraction was purpose-specific. Now, those of you who have t attended my uh, lectures on system science and in my course um, on 394-858 will recognize this immediately. And you know she she had really good examples with the subway map in um, in London um, depicted logically uh, compared to depicted geographically. And she had noted that you know it's not a matter of one being right and another wrong. Rather, both are useful for different purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, she argued that, look, abstraction takes us, successive abstraction takes us further from reality, but by so doing, it casts a wider light on, on reality. It lets us reason about a broader set of things. And, you know, that's one of my favorite, favorite quotes about abstraction. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a principle that, that really is... Um, uh, manifested quite widely within within category theory, but she also talked about commuti uh, co commutivity and commutative squares. And you know, she used this example from family life. Um, I speak about two brothers who married two sisters, and you know, the the in law relationships one way yielded the same person as the in-law relationships the other way. Both were called in-laws in English, um, but English has rather a uh, crude designation for terms that are often specified um, in, a, in a finer grained alphabet, as it were, in, in other languages. Um, and so there, you know, in, in other languages, uh, they might go by different names, but it's the same person. <laughs> I've just gotten... You get to the same person in two different ways, as, as you know, the brother of my sister's husband um, versus the 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 brother of my um, my husband's um, uh, the brother of my husband. Um, in any case, um, she she argued that uh, you know this is a concept that that is intriguing. And it's not a concept that's always guaranteed, but it's a concept that uh, we seek out because it means things often that are well-defined. It gives us homomorphisms, for example. It gives us um, uh, situations that, that, are, um, uh, that are robust and less subject to error and, and easier to reason about and beautiful um, and useful often. Um, and whether it's issues of naturality or issues having to do with um, uh, defining uh, defining sort of uh, functors which which behave in, in, in suitable ways, uh, 
commutivity and commutative squares will be something to which we are drawn within category theory again and again and again. And it's, it's something that's there by design and by construction. And in, in fact, it's so central to certain terms in category theory that were introduced in that very first video, the, the six to seven minute one, like natural transformation. The very word natural is a reference to the fact that that it's robust if you get it this way or that way. Um, so if we have a, let's suppose a, um, you know, a, a, a linked list of ints, um, and we um, and and we can choose. Uh, suppose we're applying safe head, which is going to give us a maybe. Some will recognize these as monads. Uh, you know, let, let's let's say it's a it's a list and a and a, uh, a maybe monad, and we have the safe head function, which basically extracts the head of the list if it's there. But if it's not there, it gives us nothing, right? It gives us a designated nothing. It doesn't just blow up in our face. That's sort of code I like, um, not the type that doesn't blow up. And um, if we have this safe head. If we have this link list of ints, and we we want to take a you know a safe head uh, associated with it, um, uh, we can do so um, and get a, a um, as a result a maybe events right. Um, uh, but maybe maybe we sometimes are interested in mapping the list to to doubles. Or mapping the result to a double, and and what the commutivity refers to is okay. So we start with this linked list of ends. We can either map to doubles immediately and get a list link list of of what folks. If we map it, if we app map it, or 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 do a um, a map within uh, any number of other languages, what do we get? If we if we map it to doubles, we get a, a a list of what? Speak up. I want to make sure there's someone there. Come on, <laughs> we have a list of ints, and we map the ints to doubles. We get a list of doubles. Thank you, thank you. We got a list of doubles, so we can start with that, and then we can do the safe ad. And we get a, what do we get out then? If we have a list of doubles and we do a safe head, we get a, yeah, good, good, good. Or we could, so that's one way of the square, or we could have gone, we have a, a list of ints and we could first do the safe head, map it to a, a what? When we do safe head on a list of ints, we get a, maybe of ends, right? And then we can map that to a double and get a maybe of, of what? If we have maybe of ends, we could do a map of that to a double and get them, we lift. In other words, we with F map, we lift something which maps ints to doubles to apply to a maybe. And we have a maybe of ints, so we get a maybe of what? Okay, thanks. Yeah, you don't want to look at that ear for too long. Um, at my age, all sorts of strange things start coming out of it. Um, okay, so um, uh, so so this is commutivity. We can we can map first, and then and then apply this uh, polymorphic function. Um, here we've applied a functor first and applied the polymorphic. Uh, function uh, that's that's uh, or or we can go and we can apply the polymorphic function and, and then map um, so that's an example of commutivity and it's a nice thing that those yield the same thing they're guaranteed to yield the same thing and in fact in Haskell if you forsake if you don't use ad hoc polymorphism um, it's always going to be natural in this way if you use if if you only use parametric polymorphism, you forsake. You don't use ad hoc polymorphism. You get theorems for free. Um, is is the paper that articulates this? 
and um, uh, and that's that's a nice thing. This is why we like commutivity and commutative squares. What might just be a chance event in life, two brothers marrying two sisters, is something we strive for because it yields robustness. It it avoids you know sort of what the heck. Um, sort of reactions. It, it's the principle of least surprise, as we call it in software engineering, writ large. Um, another thing that came out of Eugenia's talk is, is look, um, equality, there's a tyranny of equality. Equality is, she called it boring. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have a certain reservation about uh, that designation of it as boring. Um, uh, I think it has some interesting slides, besides, but, but there's no question that for a lot of our purposes, it's a lot more interesting yet to consider equivalence. Um, equality is, is one thing, but it, it has a lot of limitations associated with it. Equivalence, where we consider things same if they're isomorphic to each other, is actually a deeper and more robust concepts. It, it's certainly more general. Um, basically, it's it's kind of, you know, um, a rose by any other name would be just as sweet. Um, uh, if, you, if you just use different labels for things, or you just happen to order them differently, um, and they're the same, then for all intents and purposes, they're the, uh, they're the same. Um, uh, we consider them the same. And category theory um, is centered around equivalence. It's centered around uh, this notion that, look, the, the essential thing here is, is uh, if we forsake labels, they're basically the same. So whether it's a set of A, B, and C, or a set of 1, 2, and 3, um, or any other three, three size thing, we kind of abstract away from. Um, and this gives us a, a power um, in terms of reasoning, but in, in, in generality, which uh, both of which are, are impressive. Okay, um, uh, so uh, we like to, to to go in this route that um, that captures um, uh, captures this broader notion of equivalence that came up in Eugenia's talk. It's going to come up in videos that you see. And going to come up in, in important ways, uh, even in programming. In programming, we don't have this a lot of the time. And it's what makes programming a nuisance and painful sometimes. So, like, if you have a tuple, or if I have to impose it upon myself, a tuple, um, of A, comma, B, comma, C, um, you know, in, in Haskell... And in most languages, that's not the same as a, a comma b grouped comma c. Uh, in other words, if it's a if it's a nested two nested pairs, you know, a and b nested together, and then c in the outer pair with with them, it's not the same as for the programming language type standpoint as a comma and then b and c grouped, and it's a pain, you know they're. They're, they're kind of equivalent, and, and we write helper functions, utility functions that map between them. It, it, they're just translation functions that, that kind of translate these equivalent forms. Um, and it's, it's a lot of boilerplate, but it's not really, you know, the heart of the matter is they're basically the same, um, and we'd like to be able to treat them as the same, okay? Okay. Um, she spoke also about universal properties, um, and and this is going to be a, a concept we'll we'll return to in a number of guises. Uh, it has to do with finding the best of something, the single best thing for 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 a for a given thing. Maybe it's the product. It's the one-stop shop for pairing up things, um, or the co-product the one-stop shop for saying either you have a this or that. You're probably more familiar with either. But um, in it, 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 a rose by any name, it smells just as sweet. It might taste as sweet too. Um, 
so universal properties come up there, but they come up in limits and they come up in co-limits of, of broader sorts as well. And um, whether it's cones and wedges um, or, or factors having to do with um, uh, universal properties associated with, um, uh, with, with categories that are more sophisticated, We'll, uh, we'll be returning to it a number of times. And, uh, and it, it gives us a way of, um, of ensuring uh, a certain uh, clarity on what the best representation is for things. Now, it turns out certain things that we'll be discussing in this discussion group and in the subsequent course, like adjunctions, um, allow you to reason about this I, this optimization, this kind of the best representation without even having to go through a large argument about about the universality and proving there exists a unique morphism that maps this to this. Um, it, um, it, we, we can use adjunctions to kind of reason to get uh, a lot of those guaranteed properties out of the, the general features of adjunctions, which is one of the things that makes them so powerful. Um, uh, so, so I thought Eugenia's uh, uh, talk there was interesting, especially because she she wove into it so many you know familiar examples. Her subsequent talk was geared towards people who you know aspire to understand category theory. Uh, predominantly programmers. It was also at um, uh, at Yao, I think, and in Australia, and um, uh, and it was focused on. Don't, no, it may have been at may have been Lambda World Cadiz, um, uh, but you know she systematically went through a lot of basic structures in category. She talked about the definition of a category, and she did talk about. Um, some of these um, some of these universal properties limits um, and uh, spoke about uh, uh, natural transformations and adjunctions and uh, a number of other a number of other uh, items um, okay um, uh, any concepts on that before I get into some foundational material and to get into some basics of categories here any any comments on those uh, videos um, that y you think I'm unlikely to kind of get into with with notation and, and talk about the notion of a category? Anyone want to uh, speak up about anything that interested them or that they found really confusing or discordant between them, where one thing seemed to contradict another? Um, anyone want to speak up there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Others who might want to say something uh, about natural transformations uh, before I, I respond. I, I'm really interested in hearing people's uh, perspective of where they got stuck with that. Did, did others struggle also with natural transformations? So that could mean a universal no. It could also mean a universal yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm. Uh, I'll tell you that the first time I saw natural transformations, it took me a while to wrap my heads around them. My head, ar <laughs> my heads around them. Um, uh, I have enough trouble with with this one. Um, it's caused me enough grievous trouble in life um, through misjudgments and blindness. Um, uh, but I guess I could use another set of eyes and another set of ears for sure. Um, uh, the, uh, natural transformations are one of these concepts that when you try to penetrate the explanations given to it, um, I, I find a lot of the notation gets in the way. Um, uh, it, it takes a certain amount of going over and over it. Um, but that example I gave earlier, 
with less events being mapped ultimately to maybes of doubles, either by mapping the list to a list of doubles and then applying safe head to that, or by starting with that same list of ends, on that upper left you could think of it, and mapping, uh, sorry, and, and applying safe head to get a maybe events and and then uh, going and, and mapping that to a maybe of doubles. Um, you get to the same place two different ways, and with a natural transformation, you, you you're see, you, it, it guarantees that whichever way you go, it's going to be the same. It's going to be well founded. So whether you go this way or that way, um, whether you you um, you essentially uh, map to doubles and then apply the polymorphic function or apply the polymorphic function first and then map to doubles, mapping the the uh, the maybe um it's it's the same and uh this is a extraordinarily important idea that that really has to do with sort of the robustness of the results in in a programming concept to minimize surprise but it also has to do with um providing guarantees programming wise that are that are used universally so a, a lot of what we see on the monad front for example or in the algebra front and and other contexts um uh turn out to hinge on on uh, natural transformations and things that people here might know of uh, monadically where like you you uh inject a value into a monad um uh, pure or return um, where you you take a value and you create a singleton list from it for example or you create a maybe of that value with some you know, some of three S-O-M-E uh, of three uh, you know is a maybe of, of, of events um, uh, that's uh, th that operation actually turns out as a, has a natural transformation associated with it um Natural transformations uh, we'll spend some time on, um, and uh, and I find the explanations helpful um, from different angles. Um, but the notation is admittedly a little bit uh, confusing, and um, and uh, I find you 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 want to try a bunch of examples before you uh, start developing concepts. Uh, developing a really firm concept uh, of it that's really in, intuitive. Uh, so, so that's really helpful, and I think we'll try to spend more time on on that together as a group. Uh, other other things that people found really intriguing or really challenging with the uh, the videos, or or you know otherwise bearing comment. Hmm. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move forward then. Um, I did ask you in a subsequent request to take a look at some uh, foundational material. And this was kind of adding insult to injury atop these earlier videos. I asked you to, to, to get started on this first transect we're, we're, by which we're traversing from here to you know, uh, to the paw or something um, uh, via the, the, the waterways um, and the lowland valleys, the low, uh, the, uh, the bottomlands. Um, and um, these two videos uh, were taken from the MIT 2020 course, which uh, Winchell, myself, and uh, Stallion uh, uh, attended. Uh, and uh, the first of them provided some motivation. I'm going to go lighter on that. But the second of them um, uh, introduced uh, a lot of key elements of notation, many of which are are written here. Uh, and I've actually taken the liberty of adding some items here. Now, truth is, I have, I have another slide, which is for the starting point of this other transect we'll be taking later on the, the uplands. But um, 
while I was thinking about grouping them together and covering surjections and injections and and partitions here and uh, and going into some uh, some additional discrete math um, to ground everyone. I figure we'll come back to that later because we'll really need it more later when we're talking about the mathematical modeling side of things in another few lectures. Um, and there's some really cool examples there that will draw on that. But I, I thought we'd do really well to, to emphasize some things here um, that are very important. Um, you know, it, it may look like I've thrown a bunch of arbitrary factoids down um, um, and you might be tempted to say what you know what 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 these are disconnected sort of um, uh, arbitrary facts in fact um, uh, all of them are motivated by particular needs that I see ahead it's it's like we're packing our satchels for the the transect because we're gonna need these specific you know types of paddles for this uh, this route and we need these waterproof bags for those rapids etc um and so i'm trying to head off things that have tripped uh tripped me up or that often trip other students up i see many of the same questions come up again and again and i'm trying to head off some of those um uh okay so uh i've shown a bunch of notation here and you know Notation is not particularly privileged at all. It's, it's kind of arbitrary in many cases, but we need some convention to communicate. And um, uh, I've, I've put down a number of things that I want you to, to be aware of. Um, uh, we're going to use a lot of kind of fancy scripts and letters in this discussion group and in the course. And that's kind of goes with this territory. Um, I, I ran out of time before this uh, discussion group, but uh, you know I was thinking of putting together a little uh, a little uh, crib sheet, which basically uh, indicated uh, what sort of notation is used for different things. Um, uh, so, for example, lowercase letters like A, B, C, you know, or uh, and particularly letters like C sub 1, C sub 2, lowercase again, are typically objects. They're almost entirely objects, okay? Uh, morphisms are given F, G, H, uh, kind of by reference to the fact that in some cases we're dealing with functions. Now, in many cases, we're not. Remember, morphisms are more general than functions. Functions are the morphisms in one category, and it's close cousins, the category of sets and functions, or fin set as well, um, finite sets. Um, uh, there's a lot of categories where we have functions, but then there's many categories where the morphisms are not functions. They're like A is less than B, uh, less than or equal to B. We need that self arrow too, so we need that equal in there. Uh, uh, or, or it's, you know, A is an ancestor of B, or is a descendant of B. Um, uh, allowing self descendantship. Um, uh, it may be that um, that these relations are in a Claisley category, where an arrow A to B actually means A to some monad of B. You know, um, I, I can produce, I take in an A and I produce a, a maybe of B. Um, that's also a meaning of an arrow in some categories. Um, and uh, and so uh, when we have these arrows, we use we usually designate them by F, G, and H. And it's not because they are functions, but it kind of is a familiar concept from functions. We and we we use that notation. Um, and then we have capital letters like F and G and H, which are functors. Um, and I'm not going to scare you with them um, right now. Uh, uh, we already passed Halloween, unfortunately, so we can't launch that then, but it'll be coming up. Um, and then uh, there's lowercase Greek letters, uh, which are for natural transformations. Alpha, beta, eta, mu. And often they, like, mu is, is kind of 
multiplication. Okay, that's why it's mu. Um, it's probably a, and, and eta I think is ein, einheit. Um, so often there's German, German thrown in there. So, um, so here um, we're, we have different notations, and I'm I'm going to hew to those, and I'll see if I can get a slide with that written up. But one thing you'll see up in the uh, upper left is this kind of weird scripted thing. And you're going to see that a lot. Does anyone recognize what letter that is? Yes, that's a letter. And guess what letter it is? I know it's not easy to read. It's a script C. Don't, don't think it's an E. It's a script C. It may look like uh, an E if you looked at my handwriting. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't want to cause you a panic attack. Um, and uh, that is a script C. And we're going to write it again and again and again. Script letters denote categories, okay? Um, uh, and uh, they're kind of overloaded to also talk about the home sets of categories, which is something we'll come to in a few minutes. Um, what is this one, the kind of fancy end with the, the sort of band diagonal uh, element uh, on, uh, down its, uh, from upper left to, to lower right? Anyone recognize that? What does that denote? The set of what? Natural numbers. That does include zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay, it does not. It's not the same as whole numbers, which would start as one. But we're, we won't deal with the set of whole numbers much. Um, uh, the set of set of naturals. Okay. Um, um, uh, this uh, Z symbol. Oh, do people recognize that? What is that used for? It's integers, yeah. So what does this include that the naturals do not include? What notable big set that is kind of, some people might say it's unnatural. What, 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 what is it? Negative numbers, yeah, yeah. So we can have negative numbers. And if, if, if you have a subscript for it, we could start using it for, um, well, it, it, we'll get to it later, probably, but um, uh, we can we'll we'll find modulo um, components. Now, um, it, one thing is kind of not this, quite the same as the other, so I'll I'll use uh, discussion privilege to kind of move this down to where it belongs with sets. Um, uh, there, these are per predefined sets. The last two are. Are, are ones that you'll see as notation for a certain class, the same class. I've just written in two different scripts that you might see. Anyone recognize what those are? Real numbers, yeah, yeah. Um, those are the real numbers. And it's, it's a little, we won't get into like, is zero, um, you know, is zero real the same as zero, um, as a as an integer um from a mathematical standpoint yes typically uh, um that's different from the type perspective and programming languages but basically we will see reals um at times and we'll use a fancy notation like that okay um okay now this is important uh, well to say it's important is like like to say um I don't know, you know, it's, it's important that a house has a roof or something like that. Um, uh, it's important that a subway has more than one stop or something like that. Um, uh, composition is arguably the single biggest, most important concept within category theory. Um, and you could quibble, but, but it's, 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 it's like, like foundational to it. And... And I want to make sure people are comfortable with both the concept of and the notation for composition. So if we have a function, we have to have compatible functions to compose them. Um, and so if we have a function a to b and a function b to c, call them f and g respectively, we can compose them to get a function from a to c. Um, so we can, and by the way, this little dash, we'll see that a lot. Uh, we'll see it in the 
um, the Oneida dilemma, we'll see it when we're talking about representable functors, we'll see it when we're, we're talking about um, uh, particular uh, functor applications, pro-functors potentially. Um, but basically it means, okay, look, um, if you have some argument, it's like a, a lambda x dot g of f of x. Um, so, so we take in, a, or, or if you're in Scala, underbar would be the equivalent of this. Um, so basically we have some input, it's given to f and the result, and f, f is applied to it and we get back, so this thing given to f is an a we get back from F a B, and that's given to G as a B, and G returns a C. And so we have something from A to C. Mm -hmm. um, this is with functions. This is, gosh, this is horrible. Um, uh, this is function composition, okay, um, specifically that I'm talking about here. Um, uh, or we can write it as F compose, G, uh, G compose F. And the way I like to think about it is, look, when you have compose, the F is kind of close to the thing it's, it's getting. So if you had a G composed F of two, I mean, the F gets it first, computes it, and then the G gets it. Alternatively, and thinking kind of in a sequential mindset, you might have F fat semicolon, and then that's what it's called, G, fat semi, F fat semi G. And this one, F gets it first, and then G is past it. Uh, it's it's kind of like a statement, you know. F runs first, and then G. Um, and any of those denote composition. Um, they denote composing F and G, and that's a function that goes from A to C. Okay. I emphasized function composition not because composition is only possible with functions. That is not, 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 not the case. In category theory, is chock-a-block full of distinguished essential uses of composition other than functions. Do, do not get in the mindset of thinking composition needs functions. It doesn't. Again, we can compose relations. A is less than or equal to B. B is less than, relation, less than or equal to C. Gives A is less than or equal to C. Or, you know, um, uh, A descendant of B, B descendant of C means A is the descendant of C, right? Um, uh, we have Claisley composition for monad uh, in a monadic concept where A goes to, you know, list of, of, of some B, you know, so, uh, and then another thing that's B goes to a list of, or, or say a maybe of C, and we can compose them through monadic operations to get A goes to the maybe of C. Um, they're not composed in a functional, in a sense of function like right here, but this is function composition. And, and we'll often go back to functions and sets just because they're so familiar to us, but it's not privileged. It's not specially, um, it's not, not special, but it will come up a lot. Also, HOM sets, well, the connections between any two objects are sets. Um, and there's a uh, kind of sad-ish thing that's of objects in a category. Although I could be taken to task and whipped with a wet noodle by a, by a, um, a mathematician because it's a class of these things. But for small categories, it's a set. Um, categories that are not of infinite size. Um, Okay, there's a notion of associativity which comes with functions as well. Um, if we, this this takes it up a level, we're dealing with associativity of, of functions, uh, and we have here uh, a, a set of three functions, not just two. Um, and here, we, we basically are saying, look, we don't need to pay attention. Um, so, so this is a property that holds true when we don't need to pay attention to where the parentheses are. Um, we, we don't have to pay attention to where we put the parens. If, if that's the case, if we don't have to worry about the parens, life is easier. Life is nicer. Um, can anyone give me an example of a case from uh, programming involving um, combinations where 
uh, associativity is not true. Can anyone can anyone um, uh, suggest something like that? Yeah, okay. Um, sorry? Uh, yeah, an integers, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's fair to say. So, um, so if, if we had, what would F be here then? Sure. Right. There are certainly cases, I'll, I'll just tell you, Jared could give this a consideration, um, but if we have something like um, minus, minus is getting involved, we could start to mess things up, right? Um, because um, depending on where we put the parens, we get, might get the wrong semantics. How do if we have division? Could you see that as being, if, if I have A divided by quantity, B divided by C, is that the same as A divided by B divided by C? Mm -hmm. So, so is, so I'll, I'll just put it down here. I'll ask you, is A divided by, so A divided by B divided by C, so I'm just showing this one, right? Is that equal to A divided by B divided by C? I just imagine they're real numbers. Ne never mind. Sorry? Yeah. Exactly. Subtraction and division are not associative. A divided by B divided by C is what? It's A times C over B, right? The C kind of flip, flips around. It does the somersaults and it lands up in the numerator um, like a good acrobat. And so we have A times C divided by B, right? And the one on the right here is very different. It's A divided by B times C together. So these two are not equal. And Alex is exactly right. With minus, it doesn't work either. Now, with square root and squares, I'm, I'm really intrigued, actually. Um, I'd, I'd have to think about that, um, uh, where that comes in. Um, yeah. Mm, right. Right, right. Depending on if you want to allow complex numbers in and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so that's good. So associativity... Is, is not guaranteed for all functions by any means. But when, it, when we have it, it's really nice. Can anyone give me an example from programming where we do have associativity? And this one's a little bit trickier. Um, the example I'm thinking of is, is more articulated. Anyone want to uh, put a shot at it uh, until I mention the particular example I have in mind? Well, well okay, give me an example with common common operators uh, say say doubles and 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 operators involving them where it is the case what could I replace divided by I could replace it by what yeah multiplication sure is 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 this the case you got it it is what else because multiplication is a monoidal operation Monoidal. It's a monoidal category, actually, that we're associated with. Give me another monoidal operation. String appending and list appending. That's the one I actually had in mind. And it's gorgeous. If you have two lists, A, B, or if you have three lists, A, B, and C, and you append the first two first and then append the, the last one, or you append B and C first and then append it all to A, it's, it all comes out the same. Because it's monoidal. 
if instead of times you had plus here throughout, you know, you just replaced it by plus, you'd also get the same thing. That's associative. But some things are not associative. Um, and uh, we like associative things. And so associativity will actually be one of these things that we need to uh, insist on when it comes to our categories, okay? Um, it's a constraint, it's a property we, we have to have for it to be nice, just like we want it to be unital. We want the, the identity to compose with anything it be, be the, that thing, okay? Um, okay, um, so, so associativity, it's, it's not a guaranteed thing in daily life, but when it's not guaranteed, that's kind of scary because you can you can you can screw up things that by manipulating things um, you know it matters you have to be really careful where the parentheses are you have to be careful where the press what the precedence is and if anyone has had the misfortune of programming with me you know I really like being clear about where the parentheses are in expressions. And a lot of my students leave them out with abandon. And I have a tendency to put them back in because um, uh, I am no longer young and I don't like having to reason about, in this language, this is higher precedence than that one. Once you know over 20 languages, I, I, I have better things to do with my time than remember precedence tables. Um, uh, so I, I tend to, to be more generous with my parentheses. They don't cost anything, which is kind of nice, other than visual space. Um, okay, n underbar. This is going to denote the set. This is going to denote the set um, uh, 1, 2, 3, da, 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 up, to, up to n, okay? And... Uh, Zero under bar is going to note the empty set. Okay? Uh, it, it, this is just a nice convention. You may think, like, what the heck? Why, why would we ever care about that? Well, it turns out that in category theory, remember this notion that we consider two things basically the same if they're equivalent, meaning if they're isomorphic. We don't get into what are the elements. In category theory, we don't tend to pay that much attention to what the elements are. Rather, our focus is on what roles things play. What's their relationship with other things? And, um, and when it comes to sets, I mean, whether it's, you know, Mary, Bob, and Alice, or whether it's, um, you know, smiley face, frowny face, and, and you know, uh, flat affect face, um, uh, we're, we, we, we gloss over that. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we consider things um, like a three-element set uh, often is, is, is our focus. Whatever its elements are, we don't care. And in fact, there's a, a thing known as, if you have a finite set category, fin set, um, you, there's a, always a thing called a skeleton category that will boil it down to just things that are equivalent. Th uh, uh, sorry. It'll collapse everything that's equivalent into one thing. And, and often we do that, uh, for example, in, uh, Gal in um, Levere theories. We have a, 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 a fin set categories where we start with a finite sets and, and functions between them. And then we go to skeleton uh, of it. Um, and that skeleton uh, basically just collapses things which are isomorphic. And it's really easy to do. And it, it gets away from us, you know, having to pay attention. Is this X, Y, Z, or is it A, B, C? Really, the essence of threeness is, is, is not something that depends on the, um, the elements. Okay? So we'll often end up denoting this, uh, this N underbar. And it comes in in the context of uh, props and these certain nice, nice categories. Um, element of, I, I assume everyone's seen that. Empty set, I'll sometimes write it with this, um, kind of this, um, this O with a, with a cross to it. Sometimes I'll write it with a, you know, begin bracket, end bracket, they're the same thing. Um, 
functions from m to n. Um, the, a key point here, and there's a missing paren at the end of this. Um, uh, uh, so functions from m to n uh, are going to play a really big role in this discussion group in the subsequent course. Uh, and, and partly it's because we'll be dealing with, um, with, with things in terms of the roles they play. We'll be avoiding looking inside of objects, avoid looking inside of, of certain constructs, and instead we'll be focusing on the roles they play. Maybe they play the best role. They're, they're the product or they're the co-product and the co-category, co the, the dual. Um, or maybe um, it's a role they're playing. They're the initial object or the terminal object. They're an object that has one morphism to every other object, a single morphism. Or they're pointed to by one, exactly one morphism from every other object, terminal object. These are special roles things play, and there's lots of other roles things play within the categories. Um, and uh, it turns out that sometimes we'll have to reason a little bit about, about um, things like elements without naming the elements, without talking what they are. And the way we'll do it is we'll talk about functions into this set. Um, so, for example, if we have a if we have a, a set of one element, so so here's a little puzzle for you. Suppose we have a set of one element, just a single thing there, and then we have a set of two elements, a separate set of two elements. How many functions are there from one element? How many distinct functions are there that will go from that first set with one element to the second set with two? How many different functions are there? How many possible functions could there be? If I tell you, I have a function that goes from this one element set, it, for every element of the one element set, it gives me a certain value for the, for a certain value from the, the, the target set to which it goes. How many such functions are there? Hmm? How many? There are two. One function takes the unique element of the starting set and goes to ex the first element of the other set. The other one, the other function, takes the same first element, of the only element of the first set, and, and it goes to the other element. That's all there is. Those are all the choices. A function from A to B, from set A to set B, assigns for each element of set A. Each and every element assigns exactly one element of set B. And here, there's only one element of set A, and for each of them it assigns exactly one element of, of set B. And there are only two such functions. Suppose I have a set of one element, same set of one element, the function is mapping from, from which it's mapping, and it maps to a set of three elements. Two, in other words, it's going to a set of three elements. So for each element of that starting set, which is just one thing, it has to assign exactly one element of, of, of those three, from one to which it goes. How many such functions are there? Three. Suppose I have a set of four elements to which it maps instead of three or instead of two. So I'm just mapping from one to four. How many such functions are there? Four. Four such functions. There's one function for every element. And, and, and so if we reason about functions... Um, we can actually know how many elements there are because we could use functions to kind of probe the element structure of these things. Um, if we have a special category that has one component in it, 
um, the the number of functions from that to another to another category with n elements. It's just n. It's just n. Um, and in general, if we have functions from m things to n things, we have a a number of such functions, possible functions of n to the m. And uh, it's really worth thinking about two such um, uh, two such cases. Now, why, uh, I didn't finish this. Um, uh, so uh, here. Um, um, so you know, let's let's talk about these. The, the easy easier one to think about maybe is this uh, this one right here, um, where we have uh, m m greater than zero and n greater than zero, and as you know, if you're going from m to n, you want to remember that okay, it's it's going to be combinatorial, right? That for each of the inputs we can get any of the outputs as the possibilities. So there's going to be kind of all these different possibilities and they're going to multiply. If we know what it is for, if we have two things we're mapping from and each of those can go to three possibilities, we'll have nine because the first could go to any of the three and the second could go to any of the three. There's no constraints between them. Um, and it turns out that it's n to the m. Uh, as a computer scientist, uh, one of my shortcuts for thinking about this, you know, is it m to the n or n to the m, um, is, you know, I think about mapping to n of 2. So if n is 2, we're mapping to, like, binary digits. Um, how many such binary things are there? Well, it's the number of bits, right? We have, we essentially, we need m bits uh, is what this tells us. For each value m, it tells us what the bit is. And so there's going to be two to the m possibilities um, because uh, for each of the m things, it's going to tell me what that the value of that bit is. Um, and I know my bones, you know, there's two to the, to the m um, uh, possibilities. Um, uh, so, you know, this is um, a more familiar concept. There's also this this one that's um, going to be less familiar. Suppose we have m as zero. It's the empty set, and we're mapping to to some set that's not empty. What is what is that? Um, well, the idea is that look, a, a function requires you for each and every element of the input set. It has you have to specify a value of the output set. In this case, there are no values to the input set. Um, so you're kind of done before you start, as it were. Um, uh, th there's nothing to specify. So there's one vacuous function that does nothing. It's it just, um, it, it, it doesn't have to assign anything. It's, it's, it's just, um, uh, is, is uh, vacuously present. Um, but, then there's the case of okay, where you're mapping to uh, to to an empty set itself, and in general, um, where you are mapping, I, I should have lift, lift, listed this as one of the possibilities. Let's suppose you have this m greater than n, sorry, m greater than zero, uh, and n equal to zero. How many functions would we have for that? Anyone? M greater than zero. So suppose we have a set of size two. Each of those two things, I need to assign one thing in this set n, but n is zero, so it's an empty set. How many functions are there? Zero such functions, because the rule for a function is for each and every impossible input, in this case, m equals two, for each and every possible one, I have to assign exactly one value of the output. And there is no value I can assign it here because n is zero. So in that case, I have zero, uh, zero possibilities. And that works out well with this rule too, because n is zero, 
and you raise it to the M power, still zero. Uh, the one that's a little bit more textured is this M equals zero, N equals zero, and David Spivak argues like, like the whole of your being wants it to be one. <laughs> it's not, the, the universe would be an unpleasant place if, if this weren't one, um, because for all other ones, it's one, um, and and it's nice if it's one, and so we'll define it as a convention to be to be one um, out there. Um, anyway, I, I won't go more into that. Um, this does anyone recognize this P? Sometimes it's written as sort of a paragraph P, I think, too. But what if if we say, for example, P of S? Does anyone recognize what that is? What am, what am I talking about? Power set of S. It's the set of all subsets, including S itself, of S. Um, and this is going to be a pretty important one um, in our in our uh, subsequent uh, uh, subsequent uh, uh, workings. Um, okay, I'm going to use this tilde equals to mean equivalent to or or, or I sorry yes isomorphic to so th so this is uh, uh, isomorphic to um, and one thing you'll see in category theory a lot is very creative uses of equal signs sometimes the equal signs are bent and curved and go over distances but they're they're drawn as two parallel lines and secretly they reflect an equal sign it's just a very creative way of writing it um, and sometimes you'll see them as long equals written um, over an extended period. So just be aware that you can read things helpfully like that, and it will help you understand some of these diagrams better. We'll see that with monad laws or algebra laws, etc. Um, do people recognize uh, the first two of these uh, symbols? I'm, I'm not sure what's covered in 260, so I don't know. This, anyone recognize? Yeah. The four all in there exists, yeah. Um, and those will be pretty important. This last symbol is called by a lot of mathematicians, well, what do we call this in computer science? Anyone know? Bang is the designated name. It's Bang, okay? That's a list, list name. At least I declare that will be the name here. But um, uh, that that's a very popular term in functional programming at Lisp in particular. Um, scheme uses has tended to use that. So set bang, for example, when you have things that mutate things. Um, in mathematicians, we'll often call it shriek, um, like like a scream, um, and uh, they'll use it in defined ways. Now, one of the most popular ways in which it's used is to indicate unique. Okay, and particularly if you see it next to, um, this is very common within uh, universe, discussing universal properties. If you see this, what this means is there exists a unique one of these. Okay, so um, uh, that's something to pay, pay attention to. There exists a unique, um, is, is what it will say. And you'll put it next to an arrow which is often dotted as well to emphasize this point. It's special, it's a unique one, and there, there, there's one and only one of it, and it's guaranteed to exist. Uh, I don't know the degree to which in your classes you've drawn on the difference between, sorry, arrow and it, it's sort of an arrow like this um, on the left hand side, versus an arrow with this kind of bar at the beginning? Is that something you've talked about? Are you familiar with how these are used differently in math or some spheres of computer science? Exactly, exactly. So the arrow is, is particularly used to define like the type of a function or the domain and the codomain where it's coming from, and the, the, the domain is from where it's coming, codomain is to where it's going. Um, 
uh, it's a little bit different than the image of a function, which is the particular subset of the codomain in which it lands. But um, uh, but uh, you know you'll say like a f goes from a to b, okay, um, and that's more like its type, how it maps a's to b's. Um, by contrast, just as Alex said, this one with the with the vertical start. That's indicating you're like defining what it does on particular things, particular inputs that goes here. So, you know, you might have um, something like, um, you know, uh, square, uh, square root um, goes from, uh, you know, let's say, um, uh, I tempted to say um, uh, naturals to to reals um, and uh, I'm just going to define it uh, in this way here um, uh, and, uh, and and that would be its its type as it were its domain and its codomain and then I could define square root of uh, oh, I could define what it does for different particular values so zero is going to be mapped to zero um, you know, one is going to be mapped to one, uh, two is going to be mapped to, you know, the square root of, of two, 1.414, whatever, um, and, uh, and three is mapped to whatever it is, two point uh, mumble, um, uh, uh, no, it can't be 2.61, what am I saying, two, uh, 1 1.61, blah, 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 whatever it is, um, and and so this would define the you know that function as 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 it applies to different inputs. Okay, so it, it's illustrating how it operates on particular values or what it maps to what given a certain value to what does it map it. Okay, um, um, we've kind of talked about uh, these functions up above uh, products. Um, I don't know that for this audience I need to talk about it that much, but um, in in uh, programming, you know, we will denote a, a pair of things, and, and that's what a product is. It's a it's a pair of things. In mathematical notation, we will denote it uh, using something like uh, like this. So it's it's like one set cross another set, where this is actually not an X. It's a it's a it's a cross operator and and that will indicate we are creating a product of these these two things um, and um, the way it's manifested most commonly is in pairs although it's more general than that okay um, so uh, so products will be an important component of our journey co-products which basically have to do with either or either structures uh, will also be very important, but I won't get into it. They, in set, they turn into disjoint unions of things. Um, um, and definition of a function I, I just uh, talked about, and I should probably move this uh, up, up there. Um, any questions about these particular ones right now? Um, we're running out of time, but um, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, highlight a few things about categories, and we'll come back and talk about this in more detail last time. Okay, um, it's really interesting. The two transects we'll be taking through this territory, from from uh, Regina up to the Paw, um, on the river bottoms and the... Um, and the waterways uh, compared to the upland route, um, they will get us to categories and functors, but it will actually take uh, very different amounts of time. So here you've already seen the glimpse of a category defined in um, this uh, video that I, I provided. The other transect, it won't be defined in its fullness until lecture five, I think, or so. And in fact, the, V categories will be used before that, and post sets, and and, and pre-orders, and monad, or sorry, um, monoids, 
and even monoidal pre-orders will be defined before it. Um, and um, and there were some didactic you know considerations that gave rise to this. Um, but it's going to be central uh, enough here that I thought we'd do well to see it early, and then you will see it later um, uh, in in that other transect when we get to it. Um, so I provided you in these slides, which of course I'll be releasing um, after this, uh, several links to definitions of categories. Um, the first of them is, is the one uh, right from uh, here, um, the one I had you watch. Um, this is actually from the talk by uh, Eugenia Chung, the second course by, uh, the second talk by her, um, which I recommended to you. And she has it sort of nicely laid out. Um, uh, and David Spivak defining it. And this is actually, this onus of defining four, ob four elements that are required is, is really an interesting uh, sort of aside that David Spivak makes at one point about, um, about how to think about defining a category. So, the, you know, all of these definitions, though, come down to a couple things. We have some elements or data that we're specifying for these categories. The, the tendency in, in category theory is to call this the data. I have some kind of mixed feelings about it, but basically you need to give me a set of objects or... Okay, it's a class of objects, okay? Um, uh, these are objects of this category C. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, for any two objects, there's a set, and, it, and it's an honest to, honest to goodness set, um, that is a, a, what's called the HOM set, okay? So if I have two objects, A and B, I'll have a HOM set, which is, is a set, um, that is the arrows or morphisms between these objects. Um, you could think of it as ways of going from A to B. Okay, um, it could be these are functions, but it could be these are relations. You know, A is less than B. Um, uh, in which case, it might either be present or absent. That's called a thin category. It's present or absent. Um, it may be that um, that it's an ancestry relationship, and what it means is A is an an is a descendant of B. Um, but whatever it is, there's a set of these things uh, of of size uh, zero or more going from A to B. Okay, and we write it either in this notation with this C of A comma B, where C is the name of the category, um, or you write it as HOM sub C of A comma B. And, and that's using an older notation of, of um, uh, related to the fact that category uh, early on were used to reason about homomorphisms, um, uh, such as might apply between monoids, for example, um, sort of common structures in two different categories. Um, uh, and, um, and basically for each of these things in A comma B, you have a function um, it's, it's, it's a function or a morphism, uh, more generally. It's a morphism. Um, if it's set, it's a function. Uh, but if, if the category is something else, it, it can be very different, as I said. And so there's profoundly different notion of morphisms in these different categories. Do not get set on, do not get stuck on thinking it's, it's always functions. Um, in Haskell, it will be functions. It will be functions. So, there you, you're you know you're a bit more grounded, but in general it, it won't be. Okay, it it'll be much broader than that. Um, and some of the examples you saw recurrently, like A divides B, it's a category for that. And uh, and these you know the the link between A and B means it divides A divides B, not there's a function from one to the other. Okay, so these are the data, the objects in the set of morphisms for any pair of objects. But there's some, some, some structure associated with this um, uh, that, that needs to be the case for it to qualify as an honest-to-goodness category. 
These are things you have to show are the case. If I claim I have a category, it's not enough I give you my objects and I specify what my morphisms mean and give you for any pair of objects a, a, a set of those morphisms. Instead, uh, I further have to go the distance of ensuring two things. Number one, um, that for if I consider C of A A, if I consider um, uh, every, if, if I consider the morphisms from A to itself, um, that has to have exactly, that has to have at least one thing in it, at least one thing, and that is this identity morphism. It's a distinguished morphism, self-morphism. There can be many other self-morphisms. This is one of the things students get most confused about. I got confused about it early. Um, it, there can be many self-morphisms, um, many, many morphisms that go from one thing to itself, but one of them is special. It's the identity one. It doesn't uh, it's 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 a special distinguished one that's guaranteed to be there okay um and it means different things in different cases what would the identity morphism be for example if we say if we consider uh, a category where um a link between a and b means a divides b what would a what would an identity morphism be there from from a to a so so think from 30 to 30 what would that mean anyone What would it mean if we had a, a morphism, an arrow from in that diagram from 30 to 30? 30 divides 30, right? Yeah, divides it. What if we're dealing with a post set and a partially ordered set and an arrow from A to B means A is less than or equal to B? What, what would a self-morphism from A to A mean? Yeah, everything is less than or equal to itself. Just kind of, yeah, it's less than or equal to itself, okay? Nothing great to write home there, but it's guaranteed to be true. Um, and a category where it is instead of less than or equal, it was less than would not would not be okay for that. Um, so um, so it, it actually does constrain things some. Let's suppose we're dealing with sets and functions between sets. So here... An arrow from A to A is is a function from a set to itself. What function would that be? Would, what function? What would be that function then? It's the well. Each set is a set of elements, and when you apply this function, it needs every element needs to be mapped. Remember. We apply function to a set. It tells us for every element of that input set, what element it goes to. So, so suppose we have a set of, 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 of three elements. Each of those would be mapped to itself. That's what it would be. That's that function. That's the identity function. That's why it's called the identity function. That's why it's given the name ID. That's a special function that's guaranteed to be there. Okay, um, always. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, the identity morphisms uh, across categories uh, are very different in what they mean, but they're always guaranteed to be present. Okay, um, and in addition to that, that's one thing we have to guarantee. One thing, it's up to us to provide for it to be a legitimate category, a, a, a bona fide category, okay? Another thing is composition. If, if I have two arrows um, that are compatible in the sense that one goes from A to B and one goes from B to C, there needs to be a legitimate arrow from A to C, okay? There, there, I have to ensure that that's the case for my category to be self-consistent, uh, okay? Um, and Jared, I'll be with you just a second here. So let's suppose that um, I, uh, I have functions, A to B, and another function, G, 
from B to C. Um, there needs to be a function that's the composition of those. F, you know, given a value, it's F of G of that value. Um, excuse me. Um, a, a G of F of that value. Um, um, get, you know, according to this, G of F of that value. Um, uh, if, if it's A is the, you know, B is the mother of A and C is the mother of B, um, you have to be able to compose them for C to be the grandmother of, of A. Um, if it's A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, you need to compose them to be A is less than or equal to C. Um, so there needs to be present within your category uh, an arrow from A to C. There ha always has to be. If you have those arrows, F and G, they're compatible in that way. Regardless whether they're functions or relations or, you know, ancestry relationships or divides by, you have to have that link that, that, that it's, it's, uh, you, you can follow it and, and get something from A to C. Um, and that divides by will guarantee that as well. Um, so that's something you have to provide. And because these things have to be guaranteed for a, for a category, we don't draw these arrows. In a Hasse diagram where we draw out a category, we leave those arrows out because they're known to be there. There can be lots of other self arrows drawn from A to A to A to, you know, lots, lots of things that are not the identity. Those are drawn. And there can be arrows from A to B and you know, B to C that are drawn, but you're not going to draw A to C because it's implied. It's guaranteed it's there. We don't have to draw it and it would make our diagram, you know, uh, ugly. Okay, um, so uh, what composition means will differ from category to category. Um, again, in a Kleisley category, you'll be composing A to a monad of B and B to, the, to a monad of C, and you'll compose them into A to a monad of C. Um, it's a different rule for composition. I tell you what my composition means for my category, but the composite of any two arrows has to be in my category by my rule for composition that I define. I dictate what composition means in my category, and I can choose what it means, but um, it always has to be, pre if, I have, if I have compatible functions, F and G, or compatible arrows, uh, F and G, they, they have to be able to compose. There has to be one that's their composite in the category according to my rule. Okay, Jared, yes, you were going to say something. Good question. Um, a permutation will be separate arrows. Um, so, so if let, let's suppose we have a set um, of elements um, one, two, three, and one is mapped. So the identity arrow, which is a special arrow, it, you'll see why it's special in the axioms in just a second for unitality ax axiom. The identity is special because. If you do it, you can do it as many times as you want, and it won't modify anything. But things that change, like map one to two, and two to three, and three to one, that's that's maybe a permutation. But it's it it like if you apply it multiple times and then apply another function, you might get something different than if you didn't apply it at all. Okay, so so the identity function is a special function because you can do it many many times, and many times you do it. You're guaranteed, if you do another function, to not have any change from a, just applying that other function by itself. And yeah, um, so so this gets to this these constraints or these axioms that need to be met. Um, so there's there's two axioms. One is associativity, which we we, we saw up, up, up here before. Um, basically, you shouldn't have to remember the parentheses. Um, you shouldn't have to remember, you know, where you you put the parens uh, uh, for your category associativity should be guaranteed um, so with monoidal operations like um, uh, like uh, 
you know, uh, with with plus and times and so on, it's going to be guaranteed. It's not for division or, or minus. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing, though, is unitality. And probably I should have written this first. For all morphisms f a to b. Okay. Now, this is this is important enough. The subscripts here they they deserve not to be um, not to be hidden. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, I will uh, I will show this if if I have um, oh God, um, this 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 zoom has this bad habit about sticking these things in um, in un, untimely and un, ungainly places. oh gosh no 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 what what happened there it got it got messed up gosh that's horrible um, okay um, now it's e uh, eclipsed again. Let's let's just give it some time. So if I have uh, for any function, no, any morphism a to b, um, my identity morphisms have to be such that I can stick an identity morphism in before applying f and not change f. It's just the same as applying f. Or I could stick it in after applying f and just get f. But you'll notice I, I labeled the one before id a and the, the one after id b. Why is that? Does anyone know? Like, why did I label id a before the fat semi, but id b after the fat semi? Anyone? Yeah, and so, so f is mapping a to b. And, and so if I have identity A and then F, basically identity A goes from A to A, and I'm at A, and I can apply F, and I get a B, right? Um, just like applying F by itself. The identity A didn't matter. It was like a knob, a no-op. Um, um, it, 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 it didn't matter. Or I could apply F first. That maps from A to B. And... Um, and then I could compose that with. So again, the fat semi, remember, is compose with. If I if I have fat semi of two morphisms, I get another morphism. So here I could do the the composition of F and I D B. F maps A to B, and then I do I D B and it maps B to B, but in a way that doesn't change anything. And all those have to be the same. All those have to equal F. Like so the the IDs don't matter, and that's why it, permutations wouldn't cut it. Like, if, if I had a set, and I permuted it, and then applied square, um, I'd get out different values than if I uh, didn't uh, permute it and applied, uh, applied square. It would be, be a different function. You know, the composition of permuting and squaring is quite different from just squaring, if you see what I mean. Does that make sense to go back to your question, Jared? Yeah. And you'll notice that these are distinguished, IDB and IDA, because one operates on A to A, and then you can compose it with F, which is A to B. Or the other one is B to B, and, and you can be post-compose it with A to B. So you go A to B, and then B to B. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the, the constraints. We need these things to be true. So we specify the objects and, and the morphisms, what those mean for our category. We have, to, we have to specify what composition means in my category. And for any two compatible arrows, A to B and B to C, we have to provide an A to C, guaranteed us in the category. We have to make sure that for every A, Every object A, there's a identity arrow from A to A, which means different things in different categories, but it means always across all categories. If you do it multiple times, you don't, it doesn't change the semantics. Uh, and uh, and then you um, and then you have to make sure that your your category uh, guarant provides these guarantees of unitality um, and and associativity. So. So that's an indication that your uh, identity morphism is meaningfully defined, and you have to have this be associative. 
So these are the basics of, of categories. And there's a very nice little link here where David Spivak takes this further, better than anyone I've, I've heard. I mean, he, he really sort of nails this, um, this sort of intuition, which is in the background. And he says, look, don't take this super seriously, but, but um, when we have categories, often we have these morphism, uh, sorry, we have these, uh, these objects, and the objects come with a certain amount of, they have elements, but they have some structure internally and they have some properties. And, and morphisms map, think, think like a, a, a function. Um, it maps elements to elements. Like if I map a function of two things, it can be zero or one as the input, and I map it to three possible things as the output. Um, maybe because we're computer scientists, I'll, I'll reverse it. Maybe we take three things in, three possible things in. You know, a horse, a pony, and a... Uh, you know, uh, Archaeopteryx, um, uh, the proto horse. Um, um, no, that's a that's a that's a bird. Um, sorry, uh, Eohippus. Eohippus. Okay. Um, so we have we have uh, the horse, we have the pony, and we have the Eohippus. Okay. Um, and for each of them, <laughs> I assign a bit. <laughs> you know, like is it living now? Um, so uh, the first of them, horse, is assigned a one. Um, you know, the species is, is currently extant. Um, for the pony, it's assigned a one, and for Eohippus, it's assigned a zero. Poor, poor guy. Um, and uh, this function maps elements to elements, right? It, it, it maps from the input category for each of the possibilities, a horse or Eohippus or whatever, it maps it to, uh, to, to element in the, in the codomain and what it's mapping it to, one or zero. Okay, um, but in many cases, we also think of it as preserving structure. Now, sets don't have any serious structure, and this is part of the challenge in explaining this, but we're gonna be talking about categories where there's gorgeous structure within the objects. Like each object is a monoid, um, and we, we have morphisms between them that are monoid homomorphisms, and, and those, uh, those morphisms will will preserve the structure of the monoid, it kind of like like um, embed the structure of the source monoid into the destination um, monoid. Uh, it'll, it'll embed it. And so these morphisms often preserve structure in addition to mapping elements to elements. Um, might be worth a look uh, as, the court, as the discussion goes on. Um, uh, in the lecture I asked you to watch here, um, there's a couple examples that are discussed. One is post sets. These are these partially ordered sets, close, close cousin of pre-orders. Um, and, uh, and that's like A is less than B, etc. Um, but also mentioned, I think, is cat. Now, when, when you see a, a category, uh, a, uh, this, a sort of label with in bold and Often that's a sign here that I'm writing, this is a known category, okay? It's called cat, that's its formal name is cat, and it's the category of all categories. So each object is a category. Um, and uh, it's a common one that will come up, and then there's uh, vector spaces. And one of the really powerful things Eugenia Chung talks about is category theory has these small categories, these kind of ones that are, you know, on, um, uh, they're kind of unassuming and, and smaller. And then it has these big categories that are, uh, you know, include all categories or all monoids or, or a category of functors and the morphism nat or natural transformations between them. And you often go up and down and, and sort of your reasoning about these. You'll start with reasoning about this as your category and then imagine embedding it in a bigger category in ways that are, are really... Um, uh, really quite um, uh, insightful sometimes. Um, I mentioned this convention of, of, of only drawing things not guaranteed to be present. These Hasse diagrams are how we draw many of these. There's a another um, uh, convention or, or, or tradition of drawing what are called uh, 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 string diagrams, okay? Um, and, um, and as I mentioned, you can have diverse self-arrows other than identities. Um, 
uh, I mentioned thin categories where if we have two objects A and B, we um, we only have uh, one or zero links between A and B. There's either a link or not. And an example of this would be in uh, pre-orders of post sets where we have it, it, a link between A and B indicates um, a relation. Is A less than or equal to B? Um, and either it's true, and so there's a link, or it's false, and there's not a link. Um, so here the HOM set, um, the, the number of morphisms, number of these things called arrows, I'm using that totally interchangeably, between A and B is either zero or one. Um, uh, it's, it's, and, and morphisms from A to A is, is one. It's, it's the identity morphism. Um, but um, uh, there's other categories like like sets and functions between them, which have tons of morphisms often. Um, uh, and uh, and so we'll, we'll, uh, we call the ones that have zero or one uh, morphisms in each home set uh, thing categories. And then there's a thing called discrete categories, which are categories with no arrows other than identity arrows. So the only arrows in there are identity arrows from A to A's, you know, like, so if you have objects A, B, and C, each of them will have an identity arrow, um, and that's it. And those, those arrows must exist for it to be a category, for it to qualify as a, as a genuine category, they have to exist, but those are the only ones we have. Those are called discrete categories. Um, uh, and they, um, uh, they, they're often um, used for very uh, simple illustration. Uh, for example, category one is a discrete category. Um, it only has a self arrow uh, in it. Um, next time we'll talk more about um, uh, some smaller categories. Um, okay, uh, I uh, will have to get to a meeting. I appreciate your patience in finishing this up, but um, uh, I'm going to assign um, another uh, video um, for next time, possibly I will do two. I'm, I'm currently leaning against it. And um, I'm going to ask you to probably undertake uh, a few small exercises associated with that so you can test your, your intuition. And I'll be providing you some links to other videos that has some related material in case you'd like to, uh, to tap those. Okay? Thank you very uh, much, folks, and uh, wish I had more time to, to talk now, but uh, hope this has given you some elements, and I think we'll, we'll try to go strong on the discussion side uh, next time to, to allow people to ask questions. Thanks very much, and you have a good day.